Because I find this some, somewhat amusing when they say, oh, but you know, in El Salvador, they arrest people and some of the arrested are innocent. And I'm a little baffled because I wonder if in the UK, all of the arrests are of guilty people. What would you do if the presence of gangsters plagued your entire life? Not just one or two, but gangs upon gangs that held way more power than the officials and government. At least 68,000 people have been arrested. This isn't a scene from a movie, but the day-to-day -day life of the residents of El Salvador. Gangs upon gangs, with a grip so tight on the community that even the government's attempts at reform are met with fierce retaliation. Inside this mega prison, you'll find some of El Salvador's most dangerous gang members packed into massive cells in what looks like bird cages. Prisons, they've become headquarters for these gangs, with officials having little to no control. Stepping outside means risking your life, and the constant fear that your child could be the next recruit is a constant shadow over your family. Neighborhoods are emptying as families flee the country in search of safety. That was, however, until President Nayib Bukele stepped onto the scene. In January 2023, he initiated a move that would begin to change the narrative. It's called the Terrorism Confinement Center, or CICOT. The inauguration of the Center for the Confinement of Terrorism, or CICOT as it's more commonly known, marked the first victory in a long battle against gang dominance. As much of heaven as it was for the locals, the prison became a living hell for the gang members. And today, I'm here to show you what life is like in that prison. The leader who waged a war against the gangs. El Salvador used to be known as the land of the dead because of the many gangs there. But things have changed drastically, all due to President Nayib Bukele. He's made some tough decisions to fight against the gangs, and while not everyone agrees with his methods, it's clear that the country is becoming safer and more peaceful. In 2024, El Salvador has seen fewer murders than last year. Up to April 6, 2024, there have been, on average, 0.28 murders a day, which means about 1.6 people out of every 100,000 have lost their lives. This year, there have also been 74 days when no one was killed at all, but it hadn't been like this always. Quite the opposite, actually. In fact, last year in 2023, where the murder rate was a bit higher, with 0.42 murders happening every day. This was equal to 2.4 murders per 100,000 people, but guess what? This was the lowest it had been in a century. Now, compare this to 2022, where there were 342 fewer murders. This change is huge, especially when you think back to 2015. Back then, El Salvador was known as the murder capital of the world. It's not a title any country wants to have, but this one wasn't for nothing. It has been a very violent place since 1991, even though it wasn't at war. It became one of the top 20 most violent countries in 1994 and was the most violent country for several years at different times. The worst was around 2015 when gangs were raging. Almost every day, an innocent civilian became their victim. But by the middle or end of 2021, things started to get better. El Salvador was no longer on the list of the top 20 countries with the highest murder rates. This shows a big change for a country that has been dealing with violence for more than a century. So, a president being angry at others for telling him how there had been too many arrests doesn't sound that bad. Relatives of those detained have been desperately trying to find out what's happened to them. Today, I've got some super exclusive footage that you probably haven't seen unless you follow the president of the country. It's a whole system designed to crack down on these gangs. Right as you step into the center, you notice how tight the security is. Keep in mind that they're treating the gang members like terrorists here. The members of these terrorist organizations are the ones who will go to Secot. We have made a commitment to the people of El Salvador that they will never be released. Right from the get-go, there are measures in place to make sure that when these prisoners and gang members are brought in, they're not carrying any forbidden items. And no, I'm not just talking about metal detectors. 
They've got these high-tech scanners that use x-rays to check every nook and cranny, making sure none of these gang members can sneak in anything. We're talking about scanners with such high quality that they will literally scan your internal organs, the lungs, the bones, and all. So no sneaking anything up your pants will work here. And then comes the second stage. All the gang leaders, gunmen, and local leaders who caused all that violence, no need to imagine the havoc they wreaked on the locals, will now be entered into the prison information system one by one. Not a single move by any of these inmates goes unnoticed. They're under surveillance round the clock. CCTV cameras have been installed throughout the facility, and prison guards are constantly monitoring the premises. And believe me when I tell you, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how strict this prison really is. It's not like they have any choice, though. In the past, prisons were sometimes built right in the middle of local neighborhoods, schools, markets, you name it. And with all the control these gangs had, you don't even have to guess what happened. Yep, they terrorized the locals. Not this one, though. This center was built completely isolated from any nearby population. Where? Well, it was near the Shishontepec volcano in a rural valley. They acquired around 166 hectares of land, and the construction area itself was about 23 hectares. That's like seven times the size of the Cuscatlan Stadium, which is the biggest football stadium in Central America, just so you know, and that's the equivalent of the construction area. The total land bypasses it by so much more. The place has eight buildings surrounded by a tall concrete wall, about 11 meters high and 2.1 kilometers long. This wall is reinforced with electrified wire fences, making the infrastructure even more scarier. And those eight buildings aren't built with cheap materials. Nope, they made sure to use concrete, which can withstand all those prison break methods you see in movies. You know, like scratching the walls with spoons and nails and stuff. That's not gonna work here. Every single one of these buildings has around 32 cells, which take up the space of around 100 square meters. All they have are two sinks and two toilets. And did I tell you that even in those sinks, the water will be controlled by the guards? And when I say there's nothing else, they don't even have mattresses, which I'm pretty sure if you've ever watched a movie, you know why. If you guess to torture the inmates so that they don't get any rest, you'd be right. If you guessed it's so, they don't hide anything under them, you'd still be right. Because that's hitting two birds with a stone. Even the placement of these beds is quite tactical. They're placed at a raised point where the guards can see them and keep an eye on them 24-7. Plus, there are these punishment cells, no windows and all, reserved for gang members who act up. There aren't any patios or fun zones, and forget about private rooms for conjugal visits. So these gang members are pretty much stuck in their cells until it's time for their virtual trial. The president has made his stance clear. It's a place meant for punishment, not for enjoyment. So not only is it the strictest prison on the continent, but it's also the largest. That's not all. They went the extra mile to ensure that the prison has its own autonomy when it comes to energy supply and drinking water. This was to prevent any nearby community from being affected, even though the area is quite isolated and lacks any nearby urban centers. Despite its remoteness, the scale of the prison could still put a strain on local resources. So, they constructed drinking water wells and electric power substations, all with the goal of achieving self-sufficiency. But if you think that means the prison isn't strict, you'd be hugely mistaken. When I say there will be no chances of retaliation whatsoever, I mean it. You have to remember, we're dealing with former gang members here, ones who caused chaos in the country. So, containing them is no easy task. The prison has a whole armory area stocked with equipment, weapons, and everything else you can think of. I'm talking about everything, right down to the clothes. All of it is fully stocked, just in case the prison security needs to take action. And if you think the gang members could all retaliate together and get their hands on it, think again. 
because if they cause any trouble, there's not only new equipment ready to go, but the officials take every step to make sure they don't even get the chance to do so as they conduct daily searches and gather every bit of information to make sure these members have no communication with the outside world. Plus, even if the gang members do manage to cause trouble, the officials have all the protective gear ready, shin guards, midsection protection, anti-trauma chest gear, hand and arm protection, riot helmets, batons, shields, you name it. They've got it ready to respond in case any gang member tries to retaliate. And did I mention there's an army patrolling the area to make sure that doesn't happen? Not just 10 or 20 soldiers, no way. We're talking about at least 600 soldiers on duty all the time, and there are around 250 members of the National Civil Police patrolling the outer area constantly. There are seven guard towers positioned around the area, each with seven guards on duty at all times. Even beyond the perimeters, there are police patrolling around the clock. So, the chance of escape? Zero. Oh, and did I mention that the President made sure that armed forces were stationed close by? like within 11 and 19 meters, and there was enough space for more to arrive by helicopters if there was any need for more support. Before I move on, keep in mind that this center was built in months. Guess how many? Well, it's less than 12 or even 10. It took only seven months and involved 3,000 workers working together to construct this facility. Its purpose? To lock up members of notorious gangs like MS-13 and Barrio 18, known for their involvement in activities such as extortion, contract killings, drug sales, and literally any other horrendous crime you can think of. Accommodation for staff. With so many staff members needing to be present at all times, the prison made sure to provide accommodations for them too. The guards, agents, cops, and soldiers will all have access to a cafeteria and living space. You might think, well, isn't that a basic human right? But here's the thing, these are the same staff members who were often mistreated by the very gang members they were supposed to be overseeing. They used to sleep on floors and eat the same food as the prisoners, double punishment for those who were supposed to be enforcing discipline. But now, in this prison that's been portrayed as a hellhole, the officers have the dignity they were deprived of. They not only have recreational areas, but also designated living spaces with bunk beds. Not to mention, the prison ensured privacy for these officers by providing private lockers and clean, accessible cleaning areas. And let's not forget the gym equipped with the latest machinery to keep the security forces fit. It's not every day you see a prison designed with the well-being of its overseeing agents in mind. Any physical activity for the inmates? Even with tight control over the cells, prisoners get a chance to stretch their legs and get some exercise. But even this is regulated. Only a certain number of inmates are let out of their cells at specific times, and it happens every day. But don't picture them having a grand old time. Their hands and feet are cuffed, and guards stick close by the whole time. But hey, that's not the end of it. Factory for prisoners? Contrary to what you might have seen in the media, there were two modules for factories where the inmates had to work. The idea was for them to compensate for the suffering they had brought upon society. Even from here, while working in these modules, if the prisoners try to get together to arrange a riot, as you can see, the picture for them is not going to be pretty in any way. The facility hasn't been called maximum security for no reason. Agents are stationed everywhere in the area, leaving no chance for these criminals to escape. The control is meticulous, down to the smallest detail, each cell is completely individualized, and every team and platoon knows exactly what tasks the inmates have. If a ringleader causes trouble or coordinates something, there's immediate preparation for the action to be taken. Isolation cells. Then there are the isolation and punishment cells, meant for the worst offenders. You know, the gang leaders, the organizers, but not everyone is condemned to suffer forever. It depends on the severity of each individual's actions. And like I said before, this prison was built by those who had lived through the worst case scenario. Even those who retaliate in the prison would be thrown into this prison. There's no way out for them. It's just designed that way with a padlock on the outside of these cells. They have no human interaction 
whatsoever. And did I mention the lightning in these cells? It's just very little light that seeps in from a hole in the ceiling, which is just as big as an orange or an apple. So not only do these prisoners have no hope, they don't even have any actual light. Now there's a reason why isolation is considered the worst punishment. Even if you're alone and meet no one, you might still have a cell phone or a book. But in these cells, once you're in, forget about enjoyment. The only thing you're getting is a wall to stare at and good luck at doing them when the only source of light is also turned off. And if you're thinking, hey, they would at least have the chance to leave to go to the toilet. Well, that's also a no. The cells inmates are to live in have it all in there. And by that, I mean a toilet seat, a slab to use as a bed, a water tub, and that's about all. As for food, there's a hatch in the door. That's as much interaction as they're getting. Feeling sympathy for those who will be confined in these cells is natural, but so is considering the countless lives they've destroyed. Not just the lives lost, but also the families affected by their actions. It's endless. These rooms are dark, cramped, and honestly suffocating. So if any of the inmates are claustrophobic or nyctophobic, they might just have to say goodbye to the world silently. Plus, if a cop wants to keep an eye on the prisoner, there's an armored hatch in the door that will protect that officer from any attack. Even when these prisoners are taken for their last appeal in front of the judge, they can't even leave without being handcuffed. Let me take a moment to stop you here. Notice how even the worst of these prisoners are given the last appeals, but that's not something the activists will tell you. You have to survive with your enemy, or you don't. Now there's one thing we know for sure. It wasn't just one gang causing trouble in El Salvador, there were several of them. And they weren't just targeting the public, they were going after each other as well. Imagine you've been in a rivalry with someone for decades, and suddenly you're locked up in the same room together with no way out. No way to get rid of your enemy, or even get out. It's a recipe for disaster, right? Well, that's exactly what happened to these gang members. All the cells have members from opposing gangs. It doesn't sound like it's going to end well, does it? But here's the thing. The president had a different perspective on this. And honestly, it kind of makes sense. I mean, think about it. Because, well, being stuck with their enemies without being able to do anything about it? That's enough to drive anyone up the wall. Not to mention, it's mental torture in another way, too. You see, pretty soon they start realizing something. All those years of blindly following their gang, doing whatever they were told without a second thought, well, turns out the gang isn't exactly there to back them up now. It's the same deal for their rivals. You know, these gang members are the reason why tattoos used to have such a bad reputation. I mean, just take a look around. Even the ones with different tattoos are all put together. And guess what? Those tattoos, they're like a badge that shows which gang each member belongs to. In situations like this, these members are forced to confront what they've done. They started realizing that blindly following their higher-ups pitted them against people who were in the same boat as them. And now, they're all together in the same cell. So, in a strange way, this tactic is actually trying to bring some peace among these rival gangs. The food is so bad. Now here's another form of punishment in this mega prison, and it's all about messing with one of life's basic necessities. But before you jump to conclusions and think these inmates are being starved, hold your horses for a second, because that's not the case. It's more like a mental torture, you know? Imagine being served the same thing over and over again until you're sick of it. I mean, come on. Who wants to eat the same dish more than once a week? Not me, that's for sure. But these inmates don't get that luxury. Nope. Not at all. And honestly, it's just consequences. Back to the food situation, they're served tortillas, rice with beans and cream. Sounds appetizing, doesn't it? Well, try having that every single day for both breakfast and dinner. And if that's also what's on the menu for lunch, well, you can't really complain, can you? But if the inmates luck out, lunch might be something different, like pasta or a boiled egg, or maybe another kind of rice. But you know what all these meals have in common? No meat. Yep, you heard that right. Oh, and here's another twist. They can't get more than one pound of food because every plate is weighed. But hey, at least everyone's getting served the same amount, right? Let's not forget the president made sure that no law-abiding citizen's labor was spent on making food for these inmates. 
Because guess who's in charge of cooking? If you guessed the inmates, you'd be wrong. There's no way inmates in a high-security prison are getting near a knife. Instead, it's their prisoners from other jails who handle the cooking. They're the ones who aren't classified as high-risk criminals or terrorists. They cook the food, pack it, and weigh it under strict supervision. This service is counted as their community service, but they're still not allowed near the inmates of the high-security prison. And even then, these inmates can't leave their cells because, well, fear of rebellion and all that. So the food is served to them and delivered to each cell. The guards keep an eye to make sure everyone gets their fair share. Oh, and these prisoners also have to wash the dishes in the sinks they have and then put them back. Imagine having to wash dishes with your rival, but if you don't want to, well, don't get into gangs. So, how many inmates have been brought in so far? Let's see. Total number of inmates. With their faces covered in tattoos and dressed in white shirts and shorts, gang members caught during El Salvador's state of exception are finding their way into the country's new mega prison. Recent reports suggest that the facility is housing over 12,000 prisoners, with thousands more being transferred. But the 12,000 is just the gist of the number of people arrested in the war waged by the government. Since the state of exception was declared, the Salvadoran government has rounded up nearly 75,000 suspected gang members. However, around 7,000 individuals were released due to a lack of evidence linking them to gang activities. That leaves us with roughly 68,000 people still in custody. But here's the problem. This prison can only accommodate up to 40,000 inmates. Even if it were to just reach full capacity, it would be in violation of international laws regarding imprisonment. Why? Well, with 40,000 people crammed into the prison, each individual would have just 0.58 square meters of space to themselves. To put it in perspective, that's like having only half of the area of a dining table to move around in. So, which global law is it breaking? Well, it's the one set by the International Committee of the Red Cross. They recommend providing up to 3.4 square meters of space for each prisoner in a shared cell. The success of the crackdown and imprisonment. Activists in the media have caused a ruckus about the human rights violations of the people who terrorized a country. But I want you to keep one thing in mind. Every illegal thing you can imagine this country has gone through illegal drug trade, youth violence, access to firearms, homicide and whatnot, all because of these gang members. Just in this small country at some point, the 900 gangs of Central America took their share. So did this massive waged war do anything? Yes, it did. And I've discussed it at the beginning of the video, but I'll say once again that when this crackdown started in March 2022, the situation wasn't the same as it is. Women aren't being killed by gangs solely for being women. The youth isn't looking at the gangs like it's something cool that they could join and face no consequences. There's a breakdown in the gangs, even if some manage to get under the radar, they can't run illegal businesses anymore, and the power game has shifted. And why wouldn't it have worked? The situation was a state of emergency and was treated as such. There were laws that allowed the cops to make arrests based on just suspicions without needing any warrant. These suspects were kept in custody for 15 days, and then, if they were found guilty, they were transferred to prisons. If not, they were let go. That's the part the activists have been raising concerns for, which is fair enough, but honestly, you don't treat such huge violence with warning. Actions are needed, and in cases like this, it needs to be extreme. But the government didn't back down. Instead, new laws increased the jail time of these gang members, abolished the concept of house arrests, and lowered the age at which someone could be tried as an adult to just 12. Then again, when activists raised concerns about this, the president counterstated how the gang members were just teens when they started out. That's not all. Ever since the majority of these gang members were arrested, the gang territories that the cops couldn't even enter back in the day were now left mostly stranded. The public no longer has to fear entering these places because of the punishments of these gang members. So the only issue that remains is the wrongful arrest. 
which surely the government will look into once they truly abolish the terror of violent gangs. One thing is for sure the Centre for the Confinement of Terrorism is for punishment, not for rehab, because the officials have sworn that once proven guilty, these people aren't seeing the light of the day. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And while you're at it, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon.